Why do we age? No, not in the abstract. Right now. In the mirror. It's that one gray hair that decided to move impermanently. It's the morning you wake up and your back makes a sound you've only heard in horror movies. It's watching a loved one fade and wishing you could just hit pause. We've been told aging is natural. But what if I told you it's something else entirely? What if it's a series of trade-offs? A cosmic accounting error written into our very code? Because deep inside you, right now, your body is fighting a war against itself, and it's losing. But the story of how it loses is the most fascinating story in the universe. Tonight, we're not just looking at aging. We are putting it on trial. We will audit the evolutionary ledger that signed our fate, and we'll meet the microscopic repair crew working tirelessly to keep you alive. This is the science audit. Let's start with the rulebook. To understand why your body's warranty expires, you have to understand the manufacturer, evolution. And the first thing to know is that evolution doesn't care about you living a long, happy life. It cares about one thing and one thing only, passing on the instruction manual, your genes, to the next generation. Think of it like a car company. Their main goal is to sell new cars. They'll make sure the car runs perfectly for the first few years, through the warranty period. But after that, the maintenance is on you. Evolution's warranty on your body runs out right after your peak reproductive years. After the exam is passed, the maintenance budget gets slashed. This cold, hard logic gives us three foundational rules of aging. These are the core principles on evolution's ledger sheet. First, there's mutation accumulation. Imagine your DNA is a massive library containing every blueprint for your body. Evolution is the head librarian, but it's a lazy one. It mostly checks the books that get used early in life the ones for development and reproduction. But the books in the back, the ones that only get opened in your 50s, 60s, and 70s? The librarian rarely checks those. So typos, errors, and mutations pile up in those late-life genes. They're invisible for decades, so evolution has no reason to fix them. The errors accumulate, unchecked, until one day, the instructions they contain lead to a system failure. Second, we have antagonistic pleiotropy. This is a fancy term for a brutal deal. It's a genetic credit card, benefits now, huge interest payments later. A single gene can have multiple effects, and sometimes, an effect that's great for you when you're young becomes catastrophic when you're old. For example, a gene that turbocharges your cell's ability to grow and repair tissue in your 20s is fantastic for healing wounds and building muscle. But that same gene, left on for 50 years, might increase your risk of cancer by promoting uncontrolled cell growth. Evolution selects for the early life benefit every time, because that's what helps you reproduce. The late life cost? That's a problem for future you. And third, the most important rule of all, the disposable soma theory. This is the master budget. Your body has a finite amount of energy. That energy has to be divided between three key departments, growth, reproduction, and maintenance. You can spend it on building a bigger, stronger body. You can spend it on having offspring. Or you can spend it on repairing the damage that happens every single second of every day. Evolution's priority is reproduction. So, it allocates just enough energy to maintenance to keep your soma, your body, in decent working order long enough to pass on your genes. Your body isn't built to last forever. It's built to be disposable. It's a temporary vehicle for your immortal genes. And that, right there, is the fundamental reason we age. So, evolution sets the budget. But who does the work? Down at the microscopic level, your cells have hired a massive, 24-7 maintenance crew to fight back against the chaos. Let's meet the key teams. First up, the most critical team, DNA repair. Your genome is under constant assault. Every day, in every cell, your DNA suffers thousands of damaging events, from chemical typos to radiation burns from the sun. Without this crew, you'd be a walking tumor in minutes. They have two main strategies. For small-scale damage, they use systems like base excision repair, BR, and nucleotide excision repair, NER. Think of BR as a meticulous editor who finds a single misspelled letter in a billion-word manuscript, cuts it out, and replaces it with the correct one. And ER is for bigger problems, like a paragraph that's been garbled by UV radiation. It's a team that cuts out the entire corrupted sentence and rewrites it from scratch. But what about catastrophic damage, when the DNA strand itself snaps in two? This is a five-alarm fire. The cell deploys its emergency book binders. The first is non-homologous end-joining, NHCJ. This is the fast and dirty solution. It's like slapping duct tape on the two broken ends of the page. It gets the book readable again, but it's messy and can introduce errors. The second option is homologous recombination, HR. This is the master craftsman's approach. 
It finds the identical, undamaged copy of the page on the other chromosome and uses it as a perfect template to restore the text. It's slow, but it's flawless. Next, meet the factory floor managers, the proteostasis network. Your cells are constantly building proteins, the molecular machines that do almost everything. Proteostasis is the art of keeping those proteins healthy. You have chaperones, which are like folding tutors that help newly made proteins fold into their correct 3D shapes. You have the proteasome, which is the quality control shredder. Any misfolded or damaged proteins get tagged and sent here to be chopped into recyclable bits. And then there's autophagy, the full-scale recycling department. It's a process that engulfs entire chunks of cellular junk, clumped proteins, dead organelles, and melts them down into raw materials to build new parts. Powering all of this are the mitochondria, the cellular power plants. But generating energy is a messy business, creating damaging sparks called reactive oxygen species. So, mitochondria have their own quality control, mitophagy. When a power plant starts to fail and sputter, mitophagy tags it for removal, sending it to the autophagy recycling center before it can cause a citywide blackout. Patrolling the entire city is the immune system. It's not just for fighting off viruses. It's also hunting for internal threats. It seeks out and destroys senescent cells, the zombie cells that have stopped dividing but refuse to die, spewing out inflammatory fog. And it's constantly on the lookout for malignant rebels, cancer cells that have forgotten the social contract of the body. Finally, when parts wear out completely, you have the spare parts warehouse, your stem cells. These incredible cells are the body's internal reserve. They can divide and differentiate to refill and repair tissues, from your skin to your blood to the lining of your gut. They are the ultimate source of regeneration, until their own supplies start to run low. This entire repair economy is a breathtakingly complex symphony of self-healing. For decades, it works almost perfectly. Almost. So, if this repair crew is so good, where does it all go wrong? The failures aren't random. They follow a pattern. Scientists have identified what they call the hallmarks of aging. These are the predictable ways the system breaks down when the maintenance budget starts to run dry. There are at least nine of them, but let's audit the most critical failures. It starts with genomic instability. The DNA repair crew gets overworked and underfunded. More typos survive the editing process. The duct tape NHCJ method gets used more often than the perfect HR method. Over decades, the master blueprint of the cell becomes corrupted with mutations. Then comes epigenetic alterations. Think of the epigenome as sticky notes on the pages of the DNA library, telling the cell which chapters to read and which to ignore. It's what makes a skin cell a skin cell and not a brain cell. Over time, these sticky notes start to slide around, get smudged, or fall off. Genes that should be silent get turned on. Genes that should be active get turned off. The cell starts to forget its own identity, leading to chaos. We also see telomere attrition. Telomeres are the protective plastic caps at the end of your shoelaces, or in this case, your chromosomes. Every time a cell divides, these caps get a tiny bit shorter. Eventually, they get so short that the cell gets nervous about dividing again, fearing it will damage the important genetic code. This is a key reason cells enter that zombie senescent state. Of course, there's a loss of proteostasis. The protein factory floor gets cluttered. Misfolded proteins start to accumulate faster than the shredders and recycling plants can clear them out. These protein clumps are a hallmark of many age-related diseases, like Alzheimer's. Then the lights begin to dim with mitochondrial dysfunction. The power plants become inefficient. They produce less energy and more damaging sparks. The whole cellular city experiences a brownout, and systems start to fail. This leads directly to stem cell exhaustion. The spare parts warehouse thins out. After decades of dividing to repair damage, the stem cells themselves accumulate DNA damage, their telomeres shorten, and their numbers dwindle. The body's ability to regenerate itself plummets. And all of this culminates in cellular senescence. More and more cells enter that zombie state. They stop dividing, but they don't die. Instead, they sit there, pumping out a cocktail of inflammatory signals that creates a toxic, aging environment for all the healthy cells around them. It's like having grumpy, complaining neighbors that poison the entire neighborhood. These hallmarks don't happen in isolation. They are a cascade of failures, a vicious feedback loop. More DNA damage leads to more senescent cells, which create more inflammation, which damages more mitochondria, which exhausts more stem cells. The entire system spirals downwards. But here's where the story gets really interesting. If aging is just a matter of a tight budget, why do some species seem to have a platinum credit card? Take the Hydra. This tiny freshwater creature is effectively immortal. It shows negligible senescence, its risk of dying doesn't go up with age. Why? 
Its repair loops, particularly its stem cell regeneration, seem to be funded at 100% forever. It sidesteps the disposable soma trade-off almost entirely. Or consider the bowhead whale. They can live for over 200 years. A recent groundbreaking study found that bowhead whales have extraordinary levels of a protein called CRBP. This protein supercharges their ability to perform high-fidelity DNA repair, fixing broken strands far more efficiently than human cells can. When scientists put the whale's version of this protein into human cells, their DNA repair ability improved significantly. Then there's the paradox of the whale itself, known as Pito's paradox. Whales have thousands of times more cells than we do. Logic would suggest they should have a massively higher risk of cancer, since every cell division is a chance for a cancerous mutation. But they don't. This tells us something profound. Large, long-lived animals didn't just get big. They had to evolve masterful cancer suppression and repair systems to make it possible. And you can't talk about aging resistance without mentioning the naked mole rat. These weird, wrinkly rodents live for over 30 years, an eternity for a creature their size, and are exceptionally resistant to cancer. For a long time, we thought their cells were just inherently uncancerable. But new research shows that's not the whole story. Their real secret seems to be the microenvironment around their cells, which is intensely hostile to tumor formation, likely involving a unique immune response and a special substance called high molecular weight hyaluronin that prevents cells from crowding together. These outliers prove that the rules of aging are not set in stone. Evolution can turn the knobs, allocate more to the maintenance budget, and build a body designed to last. It just usually doesn't. This brings us to the bleeding edge of science, where we are no longer just observing, but trying to turn the knobs ourselves. And the most tantalizing discovery is partial reprogramming. In 2012, Shinya Yamanaka won a Nobel Prize for discovering four genes, now called Yamanaka factors, that can take any adult cell and wipe its slate clean, resetting it to an embryonic-like state. This is a complete hard drive wipe. But scientists soon asked, what if we don't wipe the whole drive? What if we just run a defrag? By giving short pulses of these factors, researchers have shown in mice that they can rewind some of the epigenetic clocks of aging, making old cells functionally younger without erasing their identity. It's the closest thing to biological time travel we have ever achieved. But it's a dangerous game. Push too hard, and you get cancer, growth without governance. Then there are senolytics, drugs designed to hunt down and kill those zombie senescent cells. In animal studies, clearing out these cells can dramatically improve health span, reducing inflammation and restoring tissue function. But human trials have shown more subtle effects so far. It turns out, senescence isn't purely evil. It's also a powerful tool the body uses to stop damaged cells from turning into cancer. Removing all of them might be like firing your entire security team because a few of them were asleep on the job. And this reveals a fundamental law that keeps surfacing in longevity science, the conservation of risk. Every intervention seems to be a trade-off. You fix one failure mode, only to expose another. Push regeneration too hard, you risk cancer. Dampen inflammation too much, you invite infection. Clear out zombie cells, you might lose a key defense against tumors. The budget moves, but the bill always remains. This is the core philosophical tension of the field. Are we on the verge of engineering maintenance beyond the limits of natural selection? Or are we just shuffling deck chairs on a ship that is fundamentally, thermodynamically, designed to sink? So, what does this all mean for us, right now, in our own lives? Aging is the price we pay for being complex. It's the cost of being multicellular, of being able to reproduce, of running a hot, energetic metabolism in a universe that relentlessly pulls everything toward chaos and decay. We are whirlpools of order in a river of entropy, and it takes constant, heroic work just to maintain our shape. That's why the most powerful approach isn't chasing immortality, but compressing morbidity. The goal isn't to live forever, but to live as healthily as possible for as long as possible, and to squeeze the period of decline and disease into the shortest possible time at the very end. And the tools to do that aren't futuristic drugs. They are the boring, everyday choices that support our body's natural repair crews. Sleep is when the city street sweepers and repair crews do their best work clearing out metabolic waste from the brain and repairing cellular damage. Movement is the oil for our joints and a software patch for our brain, boosting DNA repair and mitochondrial health. Nutrition, getting high-quality protein and fiber, is literally providing the spare parts and filters for your cellular machinery. And social connection, this might seem out of place, but a growing body of evidence suggests it's a form of distributed redundancy against cognitive and immune failures. In 2025, psychosocial stress was even proposed as an official hallmark of aging, showing how deeply our minds and bodies are connected. No single wrench fixes the entire system. The cadence of care does. Existentially, 
knowing that our time is finite is a powerful focusing force. It's what gives meaning to our choices, urgency to our love, and beauty to our art. The profound awe isn't that we age and die, it's that we get to be here at all. A self-healing machine that has held back the tide of entropy long enough to experience wonder. So, the final synthesis is this, aging isn't one thing. It's a negotiated truce between reproduction, energy, and decay. Evolution handed us a budget, our cells stretched it heroically, the hallmarks are the signs of its inevitable failure, and our interventions are just attempts to rebalance the ledger. So I want you to run your own maintenance audit tonight. If your body were a city, where are the roads pothole? Is the power grid flickering? Choose one system to shore up this week. And now, I have a question for you. What's one thing you do for your own maintenance audit? Sleep, food, exercise, connection? Let us all know in the comments below. It's a simple question, and I read every answer. And if you want to continue this audit, the next video on the end screen is waiting for you. Click it, keep asking better questions, and let's keep balancing the ledger with wonder. Subscribe for your weekly audit. Thank you for watching.